Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting this evening. Our topic today is the part two of the ankle and foot, and uh, we'll be discussing portions of the midfoot and also portions of the forefoot. This is a very challenging uh, uh, talk. And so I would like to make this as simple as possible. And I hope uh, I can make it easy for you to understand all the aspects of our study for tonight. So I would like to begin by asking everyone for a short prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this life that you've given us. Thank you, O God, for this opportunity that we can come to you and learn together this very important topic on ankle and foot. I would like, Lord, to ask for your wisdom and your grace, especially as we discuss this topic there, God. We ask, Lord, that thou will keep us safe wherever we are, and may we be freed from any viral infection and our families as well. Thank you, Lord, for forgive us for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this evening, I would like to uh, start by sharing the screen. And uh, I hope everyone can see it. So this is a continuation of our previous study on the MSK ultrasound study of the ankle and foot ligaments. And we will be starting with the midfoot. And so before I proceed, as I always uh, start this, I would like to uh, read a beautiful verse from the Bible. It says in Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, God gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. This is a beautiful promise that if we trust in the Lord, he will provide us strength. He will provide us wisdom that is needed for these challenging times. And so I would like to share with you the anatomy of the mid-tarsal and sub-tailor joint. So we're going through the anatomy some cadaver studies and of course uh, the ultrasound appearance of these particular structures. So as you can see here, I would like to begin in the subtalar joint anatomy and uh, as you can see here, uh, it is formed by the following bones. We have calcaneus posteriorly and superiorly we have your talus and anteriorly we have navicular. And of course, uh, not to mention that we also uh, will be including the topic on the cuboid because this also forms a big role in the study of the subtalar joint anatomy. So this uh, particular structures forms an articular facet. And so as you uncover them, you can see different highlights of structures as they attach to each other. Uh, in their respective uh, articular facets and of course forming a joint and uh, held together by uh, ligaments. So sinus tarsi is a very interesting structure because it is usually located at the lateral side of the uh, foot and usually the shape is uh, a cone shape. It is bigger at the entrance and it becomes narrower towards the midline. So this is a deep cylindrical or cone shaped groove which opens laterally. And it has three roots that arises from the fundiform retinaculum. This is actually 
an external retinaculum that is formed by the foot and they insert into the floor of the recess uh, forming what we call the lateral intermediate and medial uh, fibers and so interestingly this is included in our study in order to appreciate how is this formed in the process of our discussion also we will include the cervical ligament which is a vertical band on the floor of the sinus tarsi just anterior to the interosseous and so this is the most superficial structure that we could see as we view the uh, sinus tarsi structures and of course deep into it and medial is your interosseous talocal canyonavicular ligament this forms a semi arch between the talus and the calcaneus and of course eventually we have the bifurcate ligament which is found at the dorsal portion uh, coming from the calcaneum attaching to the cuboid and another branch from the calcaneum attaching to your navicular so this forms your what we call the y-shaped bifurcate ligament now if you look at this structure here the sinus tarsi is actually formed by a posterior joint right here uh, with a recess that extends on the anterior portion of the midfoot and if there is some effusion that is found here it could actually empty into these spaces right here but there is also another joint right in front that connects it to your navicular and this is a separate joint that is formed which is delimited by the bony uh, attachment or or structure between the talus and of course and calcaneus so we'll go over this in more detail in the course of our study tonight so as you can see here we have here the fundiform ligament this is an external uh, retinaculum that has actually four different other uh, parts and the one that we are going to concentrate is the structure here below and this is what we call the fundiform ligament or sometimes it's called the inferior extensor retinaculum so this actually as it approaches your uh, sinus tarsi on the lateral side of the ankle it will branch out into three different fibers we have the lateral we have the intermediate right here in the middle and of course the medial branch that goes all the way to the structure at the cervical ligament so you will notice that this uh, connection is kind of stabilizing the sinus tarsi uh, uh, structures and of course there are different ways to view this and so you will find out later how uh, it, this relates to this uh, part of the uh, ankle and of course the foot so as you can see here the fundiform ligament as uh, they call it okay which is the inferior extensor retinaculum or IER is made up of three different branches so we have the lateral so this is the one which is the most uh, external or the most outward uh, structure and then of course we have the intermediate which is at the middle portion right here and then we have the medial which is of course the inner most portion of the fundiform ligament or the inferior external retinaculum but also you can see that uh, there are other structures that are also found like for example the peroneus tertius which is found very close to this uh, ligaments and so we will also try to see how we can view this uh, when we discuss the ultrasound images later on now the lateral root of sinus tarsi is uh, made up of the superficial ligament that inserts into the lateral aspect of the calcaneus external to the insertion of the extensor digitorum brevis muscle so the question is how do we start scanning this structure so if we go from the lateral side like this okay we usually begin from the more common air which is the anterior 
talar fibrillar ligament. So for those of you who knows how to scan the, the anterior talar fibrillar ligament and look at those two ligaments there, the superficial and the deep, I would like to highlight the superficial part. And so if you see the anterior talar fibrillar ligament superficially with the bone references or the uh, bony acosted landmark of the uh, tibia, and then a talus, and then of course the fibula posteriorly, then all you need to do is to move your probe anteriorly uh, until you reach this space here, which is referred now as the sinus tarsi. And as you go anterior, you will see that you, you will be able to see the more superficial layer of the inferior external retinaculum, which actually forms the outermost portion of the sinus tarsi right here. And then, of course, as you move and look at the other details, there's also the intermediate. And then, of course, we have also the medial side, which is right here. So uh, in the ultrasound, what you need to use as reference after, of course, looking at the, uh, as I've said, the fibula posteriorly, and then following through the anterior, where the anterior talofibular ligament is located, you can see a peak of this talus right here. And then just above that, you can see the extensor digitorum longus tendon. And then there is an anechoic line that wraps around this area. And that is your inter, uh, intermediate, I should I say inferior external retinaculum. So this is uh, the one that is more superficial. And then of course, there is the intermediate, which is right here. And then of course, the medial roots, which is wrapping around very close to the talus right here. So if you look at this drawing here, the more superficial, of course, is your lateral. Then we have your intermediate. Then of course, we have your medial. And of course, between your intermediate and your medial, which is Really, this one, intermediate and medial, is your extensor digitorum longus tendon. So as you can see right here in this diagram. So this is up, up here. This is down. So you position your, your probe this way in order to see the details of this structure. So the subtalar complex consists of two articulations. We have your anterior. And then, of course, we have your posterior. The ligaments of sinus tarsi are important dynamic linkage for lower limb forces to the foot. So exactly why there are ligaments in the sinus tarsi is because they link the forces for the lower limb to the foot. And of course, sinus tarsi is the structure that are located between the anterior and posterior subtalar joint. So these articulations, as we have shown in the, in the diagram there, is a funnel shaped space, which is a larger lateral sinus tersi opening. And the, in the medial side, which is actually narrower. And of course, the peak of the cone that extends into the posterior to the sustentaculum tally, which is actually called the tarsal canal. So the anterior subtalar joint are also known as talocalcanio navicular joint is delimited by the posterior surface of the navicular, the tailor head, the oval and complex middle tailor facet, and the anterior and middle facets of the superior surface of the calcaneus. So the floor, of course, is made up of the plantar aspect of tailor head and, of course, the spring ligament. So this is the one that we have shown you early on uh, about the anterior subtalar joint. Of course, we have the other one, the posterior subtalar joint. This is also delimited by the posterior inferior facet of the talus and the posterior superior facet of the calcaneus. So if we go back to the previous uh, representation here, so this is the one that we were talking about here posteriorly, and then this is the one that we're talking about anteriorly. So uh, those structures that are found in those respective areas are the ones that forms the anterior subtalar joint and posterior subtalar joint respectively. Now, the sinus tarsi and the tarsal canal 
as we've mentioned earlier, is a cylindrical or cone-shaped structure. And it contains arteries, veins, nerve endings, synovial recesses, ligaments, and then extensions of inferior extensor retinaculum, the fundiform ligament. And this is the one that stabilizes the subtalar articular complex during walking. So the attachment of the structures found inside are the ones which stabilize the walking. And it is very important that uh, we take note that these structures are intact to maintain the stability. So two groups in the inferior uh, external retinaculum, we have the lateral and the medial. And in the lateral, we have the lateral and intermediate group of the inferior external retinaculum, the one that we have described that forms part of the fundiform uh, ligament or should I say retinaculum. Then of course, the medial root of the inferior external retinaculum uh, includes the cervical ligament and the interosseous talocalcania ligament which is the one that is found deeper. So there are also the three layered structures of the tarsal canal and sinus tarsi. We have the anterior capsule of the posterior talocalcania joint that includes the anterior capsular ligament or what is sometimes called the anterior fibrous capsule of the posterior talocalcinia ligament. And of course, the interosseous talocalcinia ligament and the inferior external retinaculum layers. Then the posterior capsule of the talocalcinia navicular joint, including, of course, the cervical ligament. So this is uh, a representation of the tarsal canal and sinus tarsi once we expose them. So here is your cervical ligament. Here is the inferior external retinaculum. And here is the interosseous talocalcania ligament, which is really deep. So again, here, this is the cervical ligament. Uh, this is the interosseous talocalcania ligament. And this is the extension of the inferior external retinaculum. So the rest are the ones that forms the facet because you have actually exposed them, which are facet, anterior facet, and of course the posterior facet. So cervical ligament, the first ligament that is shown here, that is very close to where you, you can actually view it on the lateral side of the uh, midfoot. So, so right here, sorry for that. This one is the vertical cervical ligament, okay? So this is a fibrous bridge that runs vertically. So this is the up portion, this is the down portion between the neck of the talus and the calcaneus. So this part is the neck of the talus and of course it's the calcaneus. This tends during external or valgus and internal virus rotation of the heel. So the moment you try to rotate your heel, both an external and internal rotation of the heel, this structure becomes tense. It inserts into the central portion of the floor of the sinus star C, just anterior and lateral to the anterior osseous talocalcinia ligament. So this is the interosseous talocalcinia ligament. So lateral to that is the cervical ligament. So the cervical and interosseous ligament is the single powerful structure that forms the interosseous talocalcanial ligamentous complex. So how to view them? You have to do some maneuvers. You have to put the foot into slight plantar flexion and inversion in order to improve the uh, the, the image in the sense that you can actually see the this ligament in a tense position because as you can see because of the contour of this ligament there's a lot of anisotropy so when the probe strikes this area this is the only area that will appear as ecogenic in spite of the fact that all of these are really ligament but because of the direction of the of this ligament you only see one part that is uh, very much visible in ultrasound and the rest will show a lot of anisotropy. 
So here, this is another structure of the medial root, which is, which is uh, forming part of the interosseous telocalcaneal ligament. So again, this is a very deep structure. So this is the intermediate root, okay? The black portion right here of inferior external retinaculum. And then of course, you can see also at the same time, the cervical ligament, the cervical ligament, which is more superficial. And then of course, you can see here the inferior external retinaculum here, here, and then of course here. So different views. So when you do your ultrasound, and as you put the probe, as I mentioned, following the flow of the anterior talofibular ligament, uh, looking at the superficial layer of ATFL, all you have to do is to move it forward, and then you will see this space here, and then you try to uh, toggle and do some heel toe in order to see this cervical ligament, which is found inside the sinus stars as shown here. Of course, again, because of the, uh, the uh, location and of course the, the course of the ligament, so you don't quite see it to be echogenic, but you can see the structure here showing a lot of anisotropy. Same holds true with the interosseous local canyon ligament here, which is the, the, the deeper portion of the sinus star C. Uh, using a ultra high frequency ultrasound, and then adjusting the depth, or maybe the matrix uh, uh, probe as shown here, uh, you, you will be able to visualize the interosseous telocal canyon ligament this way. So there are two separate entities in the anterior subtalar joint, namely the telocal canyon navicular joint. So the anatomical functionally linked to calcaneo cuboid joint to take part in transverse tarsal joint or the ones referred to as the Schuppart joint. And then of course the acetabulum pedis, which is a functional unit consisting of concave shaped proximal facet of the navicular spring ligament and anterior facet of the calcaneus that conjoined to socket for, for the tailor head. So uh, you can see that these two entities are the ones that are found uh, controlling the movement of the joint in the sinus star C. And then of course we have your calcaneo cuboid joint. So the first one is telo calcaneo navicular joint. Then we have here the calcaneo cuboid joint. It is formed by the quadrilateral facets of the calcaneus and cuboid. And this is saddle shape of both calcaneus and cuboid with a beak of the cuboid lodging in the calcaneal coronal fossa during forefoot flexion and adduction. So the, the one that stabilize these uh, ligaments are the dorsal and lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament, the long and plantar or short plantar ligaments. So the dorsal and lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament, uh, one of these is formed by the uh, bifurcate ligament, but the other one is the one that is really found at the most lateral portion of the dorsal foot, and that is the lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. And then of course, as we have mentioned all, already, the bifurcate ligament bridges the posterior and anterior subtalar joints and plays a role in mechanical coupling. So this is a very interesting uh, structure that is also forming part of the calcaneo cuboid joint. Now let's move on to the interosseous telocalcaneal ligament. So this is a deep uh, ligament, deeper than the one that we see in the cervical ligament. So this is the cervical ligament. So this is your interosseous ligament. So there are no reported injuries yet with this ligament, but subtalar dislocation may be secondary to trauma in a plantar flexed foot. 80% happen in inversion resulting to medial dislocation and then 17% in reversion resulting in lateral dislocation of the subtalar joint. So it could either be caused by an inversion resulting to medial dislocation or an eversion uh, giving rise to lateral dislocation of the subtalar joint. So if you look at this, this is actually viewed from the 
medial side. So this is your deltoid ligament or the deep tibiotalar component. And then of course, this is your talus, this is your calcaneus. So the interosseous ligament is right here. So, so normally we view it from here. So this is the cervical ligament. So this is your interosseous uh, ligament right here. So that is why you can also view it from the uh, area, even if you approach it from the medial side of the ankle and foot. Then this is another uh, view of the anterior capsule of the posterior talocalcaneal joint. Okay, so this is the posterior talocalcaneal joint right here. And this is your facet of the posterior talocalcaneal facet. And then of course, this is the inferior extensor retinaculum. We know this to be part of the fundiform ligament. And then of course, this is your interosseous talocalcaneal ligament right here. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, view it when you, this area is exposed and dissected. So this area is also a site by which we can do some uh, interventional procedure, such that of uh, subtalar joint injection. So this is a representation of an in-view approach from anterior to posterior. So this is the cleft of the joint. So the needle passes like this here. So you can see the shaft, okay? But also you can approach it in, a, in an out of plane view like this. And so you can just see it as a point. You don't see the entire shaft of the needle. And then you can still see uh, how the medicines could be pr provided in this uh, space right here. Now let's move on to your Schuparts or the talocalcanean navicular and calcaneocuboid joints. This is a joint that divides the hind foot and of course the mid foot or sometimes called the mid tarsal joint. Of course, we have also the least frank or tarsal mid tarsal joint. We might not be able to cover this because this is also a long uh, talk and this will just be discussed on the part three of the ankle and foot, but the should part will discuss it today. So the midfoot and Schuparts ligament. So if you look at the X-ray, you can identify that this is your calcaneus, this is your cuboid, this is your talus, this is your navicular. And so if you put a line and trace it, this looks straight, okay, or parallel, and this this one is convex, and it is very interesting to notice that. The, the varied shapes and the varied mobility of the foot allows them to afford some degree of flexibility. And that is why they can move in spite of the fact that their shapes are just so varied and that uh, it can be prone to a lot of uh, instability if a structure is found to be torn or even strained. So Schuparts ligament consists of your talonavicular joint and of course calcaneocuboid joints as we have mentioned, but this is regarded as a unit with distinct function. So what is its main function? It unlocks the midfoot into a flexible structure. So this joint allows the hind foot to pivot while the forefoot remains in inversion and eversion. So for, for instance, the hind foot will move, but at the same time, the forefoot will also go into inversion and inversion. The hind foot can move independently of the movement of the forefoot, but then it locks on heel inversion that gives the reason of the stabilization of the midfoot during push-off gait. So as part of the Schuparts ligament, let me mention that there is uh, there are about uh, five ligaments found here. We have the dorsal calcaneo cuboid ligament, which are formed by the dorsal, dorsolateral, which is the medial side, and we have the lateral, dorsolateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. Then we have here the bifurcate ligament or the calcaneo cuboid ligament, 
and of course the calcaneo navicular ligament. So these two ligaments right here is collectively called bifurcate. And of course we have another ligament right on top that connects the navicular and of course the talus right here, we have the dorsal talonavicular ligament. So let's begin with the dorsal. So this is the most lateral portion of your uh, ligament on the foot, the dorsal lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. So the lateral ligaments are made up of the dorsal calcaneo cuboid, dorsal talonavicular. We have the bifurcate ligament, or what is sometimes called the Schuppartz ligament. These are the major stabilizer of calcaneo navicular joint. So any problem with these ligaments will cause instability in this particular area. Now the dorsal calcaneo cuboid ligament has a thickening of the dorsal lateral surface of the fibrous capsule of the calcaneo cuboid joint. It is injured in about 5.5% of inversion sprains, one third of which may lead to undetectable, chronically unstable calcaneo cuboid joint. Now, this is also one cause for what they call the match fracture of the calcaneus. So if you look at this ligament, okay, this is your calcaneo cuboid ligament, and you suspect for a pathology, always check here at the calcaneal side, because an avulsed uh, portion of this bone may give rise to what we call the match fracture because the shape is like a match, you know, the match that the one used for building fire. So this is a bulbous part here. And then of course this is straight or the stick uh, where that bulbous part is made of. So that is the reason why it's called the match fracture of the calcaneus. And this is really referring to the dorsal or lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. So another view of the, the dorsal lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament right here. So this is a, a clearer view of this ligament. And this is the one being referred to here, the dorsal lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. This is from the study of uh, Ricardo Picasso and of course, Sautini, um, are my good friends from Italy. Of course, it's another one from uh, the dorsal lateral calcaneo cuboid ligament. So that's the, the pathology will usually be, be found here. So if you're suspecting for any abnormality, this is the right place to check. And of course, uh, just notice that just above it is of course your extensor digitorum brevis muscle right on top of it. Then we have your dorsal talonavicular ligaments on the medial side. It extends from the dorsal surface of the neck of the talus to the navicular. So this is the one that is most medial of this uh, Schuppartz ligament. It is joined with the dorsal capsule of the talonavicular joint and is covered by extensor tendons. We know, we know that to be the extensor digitorum brevis muscle. The, 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 ligament, the mechanism of injury is a forcible plantar strains with inversion injury and that could injure this ligament. It is associated with an avulsion fracture at the navicular side. So this time the, the uh, pathology has to be checked at the navicular side instead of the uh, Taylor side, especially when they are involved in an inversion injuries with forcible plantar strain. So as you can see here, this is an injured dorsal talon navicular ligament. So you can see here, how it becomes very swollen. And of course, uh, heterogeneous, you can see the pattern here. It's, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, injured here or sp uh, sprained right here. And then of course, this is the normal pattern that you see of the dorsal talonavicular ligament. And uh, there could be some problems, especially right here at the navicular side. So always, check that if you are suspecting for any fracture or, or, or abnormality. So the collagen fibers, as you can see here, 
and and uh, the the central portion is made up of a bundle of, of, of collagen for bundles and the tensile stress transmission uh, is important especially during the windlass mecha me mechanism this is when the foot shifts from uh, heel off to push off so that is what they referred to as the windlass and for patients or ladies who are using this especially when they're wearing high heels are in a position where all the structures are in a tense position. So talocalcaneo navicular joint is also sometimes referred to as the talonavicular joint. So that is the joint between the talus and the navicular. It is composed of the tailor head, posterior surface of navicular, and anterior process of the calcaneus. So the ligaments here are the ligaments of the acetabulum pedis, the anterior middle calcaneal facets, the spring ligament and calcaneal navicular component of the bifurcate ligament, the talocalcaneal ligaments, including the lateral, medial, and posterior talocalcaneal. We have an interosseous and cervical ligaments and the dorsal talonavicular ligaments. So this is the complex of the spring ligament. Uh, the most commonly seen is the superior medial, and of course, this is also the most affected in an injury. And uh, we have to watch out for this structure in order to check as to whether they are also involved. So another uh, image of the dorsal talonavicular ligament here. So this is from the study of uh, Picasso and Zotini in 2018. So you can see very distinct only because their, their uh, images were viewed by a high frequency ultrasound. This is another view of the dorsal telenavicular ligament. So it's a thick ligament. Well, relatively thick. Now let's go to the mid tarsal joints. So the telenavicular joint is a ball and socket joint in the foot. Uh, so it forms the socket called acetabulum tali, which is formed by the navicular bone, calcaneus, and superior medial spring ligament with this is the one that forms the mid tarsal joints including the calcaneo cuboid joint and this is also the apex of the longitudinal arch right here which is elevated when the toes are extended and the plantar fascia is tightened during the push of phase of the windlass phenomenon so the talonavicular ligament is the fourth com most common injury representing about 21 percent and complete tear of telonavicular ligament is also 42%, especially in telonavicular ligament injury. Uh, and still the most common is, of course, ATFL, followed by CFL, and of course, the deltoid ligament. So this is a typical uh, components of the windlass mechanism. And look at that if you're wearing a high heels. So this is the posture that you assume. And there is a tightening of this plantar aponeurosis this way here. Now let's move to your bifurcate ligament or the Schuppart ligament. So as I have mentioned earlier, bifurcate is made up of the calcaneo cuboid and the calcaneo navicular, forming what we call the Y-shaped ligament. It supports the talonavicular and the calcaneo cuboid joints. And then this is located anterior to the cervical ligament and origin of extensor digitorum brevis so this is more anterior to that to their location it is a y shape and this is also referred to as the lateral calcaneo navicular ligament it's y shape with its base attaching on the anterior aspect of the superior surface of the calcaneus and its arm reaching to the dorsal medial surface of the cuboid that is your medial calcaneo cuboid ligament and the dorsal lateral part of the navicular the lateral calcaneo navicular ligament so this is uh, the structure so you can see here the calcaneo cuboid this is the calcaneo navicular and a cadaver and then of course this is the cervical ligament so you can see that they are perpendicular to each other this is cervical ligament of the sinus tarsi whereas this one are the bifurcate ligament so they form a very perpendicular course of attachment 
in the ankle and foot. And then this is also another representation of the calcaneo cuboid. And then of course, this is the calcaneo navicular. Okay. And then this is of course, uh, related to, as we have mentioned uh, earlier, the cervical ligament of the sinus tarsi. So, uh, among individuals, the Schuppart ligament or the bifurcate ligament is present both in about 90.6% of individuals. However, in about 9.4%, they may only have calcaneo navicular, but no calcaneo cuboid ligament. But none of them will have uh, absence of both. So try to remember that. So the collateral calcaneo navicular ligament, which forms part of the bifurcate ligament, is uh, shown here. This is the only structure that may be visible, especially for regular ultrasound. The major calcaneo cuboid ligament is barely visible. So how, how, they, how do they get injured? So there is what they call the nutcracker mechanism of injury. There is flexion, there is inversion, and then there is an impaction by inversion and there's a flexion in the midfoot. So they, that is how they describe the nutcracker mechanism injury of this particular ligament. Then of course we have your calcaneo cuboid, calcaneo cuboid, okay, this one, calcaneo cuboid ligament. It is formed by the quadrilateral facets of the calcaneus and cuboid. It is a modified saddle type joint, hind foot eversion, inversion with 25 degree rotation. And it is also referred to as the medial calcaneo cuboid ligament because of its location. Has four ligaments, namely your medial calcaneo cuboid or the bifurcate, dorsal calcaneo cuboid ligament, or the dorsal calcaneo cuboid ligament, and then the plantar calcaneo cuboid ligament. And of course, one of the markers that we can use is the presence of the extensor deuterium brevis muscle above the dorsal calcaneo cuboid ligament. The plantar or inferior calcaneo cuboid ligament is a long and short plantar ligaments from the superficial and deep components of inferior calcaneo cuboid ligaments, respectively. So we will show this later when we try to scan the inferior surface of the ankle and foot. So again, another uh, representation of the calcaneo cuboid ligament. So this is the calcaneo cuboid ligament as shown here in this image. And then we'll move to your plantar ligaments. So as you can see, there are two plantar ligaments. We have the short and we have the long. Now, the, the, the short and the long plantar ligament is differentiated as to their attachment. But also notice that inferior to these structures of the plantar ligament, we also can see the plantar aponeurosis of the, or the plantar fascia right here. So it's very important that if we visualize this area and then increasing the depth and the focus, we can also see the short plantar and the long plantar ligament. So right here, this is your calcaneum, this is your cuboid. And then if this is your plantar fascia on top, just below that is your flexure digitorum brevis. And then beneath that is your quadratus plantae then followed by your short plantar ligament as shown here in this image. But also noticed that the long plantar ligament, which is also deep to the quadratus plantae, has its relationship with the peroneus longus tendon. So you can see here, it's like a 90 degree intersection where the peroneus longus pierces underneath the long plantar ligament. And of course, as you can see and trace it, this is the skin. This is the palmar plantar aponeurosis, flexure digitorum brevis, 
quadratus plantae. Then, of course, this is the long plantar ligament. Then we have here the peroneus longus tendon uh, uh, found in, the, in this area underneath your long plantar ligament. So here is another image of the short plantar ligament. So this is your cuboid here. This is your calcaneus. So this is your plantar ligament. And then, of course, here is your quadratus plantae just above it. So the long plantar ligament is a very tough structure, okay? And then of course you can see here, how is this related to the uh, Pironius longus tendon, which is found right here. So this is your flexor digitorum brevis. This is your Pironius longus tendon. This is your long plantar ligament. As you can see, it's echogenic, it's thin. And then we have the short plantar ligament, which is deep. And this is attaching your cuboid and, of course, your calcaneus. So the mid-tarsal ligaments are difficult to visualize even with normal. So we really need to be familiar with these structures and its location in order to see how they are attached to each other. The thickening of the dorsal talonavicular ligament is extremely common and does not imply an old sprain. So remember that as well. The mid-tarsal sprains occur in the setting on inversion injury. When lateral ankle sprain, that is the ATFL, is persistent, look for mid-tarsal sprain. There are times when you are facing a patient that, that you know is caused by an anterior telofibular ligament uh, strain, sprain or maybe there's a tear, but then you presume that the ATFL has already recovered, but there is a a persistence of pain, then it's time to look for the mid-tarsal structures that could be involved in their injury. Okay, 10 degree calcaneo cuboid angle and x-ray is diagnostic of mid-tarsal sprain with instability. Mostly multiligamentous if injured, you have always to check the two parts, ligament, calcaneo cuboid and calcaneo navicular ligament. Now let's go now to your spring ligament complex, or what is sometimes called the spring calcaneonavicular ligament, or the hammock structure. Now, as you can see, the spring ligament, by its name, does not live up to its name as well. It is a non-elastic in contrast to what its name connotes. It is the major static stabilizer of the arch of the foot during mid stance. Okay, so it's like the beam. It consists of three bundles. We have your superior medial, we have your medial plantar oblique, we have your inferior plantar longitudinal, calcaneo navicular ligament. The only one that is usually affected in an injury is the superior medial calcaneo navicular ligament. And this is also the one that is visible in the ultrasound. So during an injury, which is not really common, it involves the superior medial fibers and may extend to involve the dorsal talonavicular joint capsule and can cause post-traumatic planovalgus deformity. So eventually the patient will have some deformity on the foot. There will be a collapse of the arch and then you walk in a flat-footed manner. When untreated, it can cause posterior tibial tendon degeneration elongation and tear. So if there is an injury of the spring ligament, also check for the posterior tibialis tendon. So this is your navicular, this is your sustentaculum tali of the calcaneus, this is your talus here. So if we trace this one, this is actually the spring ligament. And just superficial to that is your tibialis posterior tendon. So wherever you see the location of the spring ligament, always remember there is a tibialis posterior right above it or even superficial to it. Same holds true with this uh, superior medial calcaneonavicular ligament as found by Suleiman and his colleagues. So right here, this is the superior medial calcaneonavicular ligament and look at the posterior tibialis tendon how it passes through 
and then attaches to the navicular like this. And there is one other attachment. We have the tibial spring ligament, which is part of the deltoid ligament that attaches itself at the spring ligament itself and not to any bone. This is an unusual attachment for this particular ligament. And this is also one ligament that is always seen okay, in the, in the deltoid ligament. So what is the probe position? So you can move it up and down like this. So from here, go down and then look for the sustentaculum tally of the calcaneus. And once you see it, then connect it with the navicular head here and then expect to see the talus in between. So it's always not uh, echogenic because of its course or direction of attachment to the sustentaculum tally and of course to the navicular head. So as you can see here, it is not really parallel to the skin surface, but it is oblique. It, it is lower on the calcaneal side and higher on the navicular side. So that is a superior medial calcaneal navicular ligament. So if you will notice, if this is your uh, ligament, the superior medial portion, then right on top of that, of course, is posterior tibialis tendon. So if there's any issue between, or should I say the gliding or the friction between the structure, then it can also involve the posterior tibialis tendon. Same holds true with calcaneal navicular ligament, the superior medial portion. So this is another representation of the spring ligament complex. So this is your sustentaculum tally, this is your navicular, this is your talus. And so you can see the attachment of these uh, structures on those areas that forms the arch of the medial foot. So another representation, this is a superior medial. So this is your navicular, then this is your sustentaculum talus. So look at that. Look how swollen that structure is, which means that there is really some problems. And of course, there's some uh, car cartilage right here on this area. And, and so you can see that it really was, it's, it doesn't follow a straight line. So there's also a lot of anisotropy in the process. So tears in the spring ligament is uncommon, but it, it can still happen. It usually is found near the navicular insertion. So where the insertion is, there you have to check if you are suspecting for the spring ligament. Of course, if you don't see anything and it's still painful, you can also request for an MRI that will show sagittal and actual images. And you can expect a bone marrow edema in the talus during an acute tear. While in the ultrasound, it's mildly echogenic, deep to the posterior tibial tendon and distal fibers. So always check, no, always notice this one. This is your tibialis posterior. And just right below that is, of course, your superior medial uh, uh, spring ligament, okay, or calcaneal navicular ligament. So again, this is another uh, image from the study of uh, Ricardo Picasso and Zotini. You look at the fibers, it's so uh, echogenic. And then of course, this is from the sustained taculum tali as well. So it's thick and it's echogenic. Now, this distal portion, its attachment and the navicular is the most common sign to see for any pathology if it involves a spring ligament. So what is the technique for scanning? Abduct. So you abduct and you pronate the foot. So there is usually a, a thickening, hypoechoic changes, loss of the granular echotexture, hyperemia on Doppler. During the full thickness stairs, there's a complete defect or discontinuity of the ligament. So as you can see here, this is a, a spring ligament here, and you can see that there is uh, hypoechogenicity. And then of course, there is a, an inflammation that is happening. This is also holds true with this partial thickness of the spring ligament here. So it's very important to get acquainted with the picture of how it really looks like, so that when we scan it by our own subs, we know exactly where to look for the, the abnormality. 
So spring ligament tear is considered abnormal when it is more than five millimeters thick. So if the thickness of the spring ligament is more than five, then suspect for some pathology. And then of course, there is a loss of stability of the medial arch. So this is the hypoechoic thickening of this ligament. Okay, this is a normal ligament. And this is a partial thickness. There's a superior medial uh, ligament, spring ligament. So full thickness there, look at that. There is a retraction of the fibers in both direction, indicating that there is really, uh, the fibers have already detached from each other. Now, there is what we call the spring ligament fibrocartilage complex. So we know there is a superficial layer of the posterior tibialis tendon, right? That is immediately superficial to the superior medial. And there is a loss connective tissue in between them. However, this top part of the superior medial, which is right here, articulates directly with the tailor head. So right in between that, there is a tailor head. Here, the spring ligament is covered by fiber cartilage creating an articular surface with the head of the talus that is termed the spring ligament fibrocartilage complex. And then of course the tibial spring is right here. And then of course, there could be a spring ligament insufficiency, especially with a posterior tibialis and dysfunction. A lax or ruptured is superior medial spring ligament results in middle aged woman in acquired flat foot with no history of trauma. So for those patients, who developed flat foot over the years, but no history of trauma, then suspect for a, either a lax or the ruptured superior medial spring ligament. So the spring ligament fibrocartilage complex that we are talking about is this gliding motion right here. As uh, we have stated it earlier, and this is what happens if there is a uh, uh, an issue between the tailor head and the superior medial uh, spring ligament. So this is the spring ligament fibrocartilage complex. So it should be right here, right here. So this is the area over the talus that is uh, the friction is happening because of the constant gliding of the superior medial spring ligament and posterior tibialis tendon. So dorsal hind foot with talus removed. So we remove the talus, and so we expose the superior medial ligament, then the posterior tibialis tendon, and then of course the superficial posterior tibiotalar ligament, and then of course the tibial ligament. So these are the structures that is exposed once uh, the talus is removed. Then of course, even as we say that the, on the superior medial is shown, when using a really good high frequency ultrasound or a matrix ultrasound, we will be able to extend from the calcaneal coronoid fossa to the medial aspect of the navicular bone. That is the location of the major plantar oblique. It's a trapezoidal shaped ligament and it is anterior to the medial articular facet of the calcaneus within the coronoid fossa and attaches to the major plantar aspect of the navicular bone. So this is uh, the exact location of the major plantar oblique of the spring ligament. So another image of this structure as uh, based on the research done by Zautini last 2020. Then we have your inferior plantar longitudinal spring ligament. This ligament lies anterior to the major plantar spring ligament extending from the inferior navicular to calcaneal coronoid. And this is the thickest of the three ligaments. So this is, uh, it's easy to say that this is the last ligament to be injured if, if at all uh, affected, because this is the thickest. This quadrilateral shaped ligament originates from the coronoid fossa and attaches to the inferior break beak of the navicular bone. So this is not routinely seen in the ultrasound. So this is also the thickest, but the least important. So tears liga a spring ligament, it, it involves just where the superior medial uh, layers 
So spring ligament insufficiency is a degenerative process due to gradual stretching and weakening of the ligament with acute tears being less common. So tears on ultrasound will appear as a thickening, loss of fibrillar echo patterns and increased vascularity. So this is uh, the one referred to here. Then of course the spring ligament together with PTT, plantar fascia and the plantar ligaments are important stabilizers of longitudinal arch of foot and such that lesions in the structures can result in an acquired uh, foot deformity. So that's, that's really the problem. So components of medial supporting complex, we have the posterior tibial tendon, the tibial spring ligament of deltoid, the spring ligament recess, and the gliding zone. So these are the components of the supporting complex on the medial side. And then of course, these are the stages of adult acquired flat foot deformity. And you will notice that there is always a problem with the posterior tibialis tendon and of course degeneration. And uh, the progression of this is due to the fact that the foot deformity is not anymore corrected. And so it gives rise to a complete failure with full thickness there of the posterior tibialis tendon. And this is also related to fixed flat foot deformity with hind foot bulbous. So with all this, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention, for listening to our lecture tonight. So we will have a part three, which will concentrate more on the least frank, and then of course the distal foot uh, ligaments, which are also equally important. So thank you very much and uh, have a good night and be safe. God bless you always.